<clears throat> At that time, Marduk Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of his illness and recovery. Hezekiah received the envoys gladly and showed them what was in his storehouses, the silver and the gold, the spices, the fine olive oil, his entire armory and everything found among his treasury. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, what did those men say and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied, they came to me from Babylon. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There is nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. And Hezekiah, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. Well, thanks, Roland and Tracy. Uh, yeah, please do keep your Bibles open to uh, that section of Isaiah, um, but let me pray as we come to God's Word together. Uh, Father God, we do thank you for uh, your Word to us. Uh, we thank you for how you point us so clearly to the Lord Jesus, and uh, we pray that uh, you will help us to see more clearly today who he is and what he's done for us. And uh, we ask that in his name. Amen. Well, giving a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down, it's not the most sophisticated rating system out there, but it's pretty effective. Um, a quick thumbs up indicates a good thing. If it's a thumbs down, that's probably something to avoid. Um, there's a very helpful website that I look up occasionally. It's called Visual Unit, and it does lots of great illustrations of things in the Bible. And one of my favourites is this one, where all of the kings of God's people are rated according to a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, or there's also kind of, if they're a bit borderline, they just get a thumb going sideways. And uh, in the books of one and two kings, there's a very similar kind of assessment. If they followed in the footsteps of King David and, uh, and followed God, then they get a thumbs up. If they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, then they get a thumbs down. I know that's a bit hard to see because it's all of the kings there, but um, on the right-hand side for you, um, you can see all of the kings of Israel, all of them, get a thumbs down. And then all of the kings of Judah, out of all of them, only three of them get a thumbs up. They are Asa, Hezekiah, and Josiah. And today the focus of our passage is um, on one of those kings who gets a big thumbs up, Hezekiah. And uh, if you were here with us last week, we heard about an amazing act of trust by King Hezekiah as the Assyrian army arrived on Jerusalem's doorstep uh, remember he acted in great faith he went into the temple and he prayed and he prayed a magnificent prayer and God answered his prayer and in a miraculous way uh, God protected and delivered his people and so in the book of two kings when we get the assessment of King Hezekiah this is what it says about him that Hezekiah trusted in the Lord the God of Israel it says there was no one like him among all of the kings of Judah either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands of the Lord, sorry, the Lord had given Moses. And the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. Now, in terms of praise in the Bible, that's about as big a thumbs up as you can get. And uh, for those of us who've been listening carefully to the book of Isaiah, 
Well, we've been hearing about a king who has been promised. We've been told about a shoot that will rise from the stump of Jesse, one who will reign as God's king over the nations, one who will rule over a time of unprecedented peace and prosperity for God's people. And so at this point in our search for that king, well, our hopes are pretty high that maybe that is King Hezekiah. Is he the promised Messiah of God? Could he be the one that the world is waiting for? Well, as we come to chapters 38 and 39, that's the big question that's in the background. As uh, all of the focus here now, now centres on King Hezekiah. And so as we consider these chapters, uh, here's what we'll see today. Firstly, we'll meet him as a suffering king then a singing king, and it's all looking pretty good at that point. But then as we move into chapter 39, we begin to see a stumbling king. And I think that will help to point us to the better king that the world is looking for. So firstly, we meet Hezekiah here as a suffering king, because see how it begins there in chapter 38 and verse one. It says, in those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says, Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. Now, an important thing to uh, see here firstly is that opening phrase where it says, In those days. And uh, scholars point out here that that is a deliberately vague way of referring to time. Uh, to when this event happened because what we actually discover is that what's recorded here in chapters 38 and 39 these events actually take place before the event of Assyria's invasion that we thought about last week now I know that's a bit odd but chapters 38 and 39 they occur before chapters 36 and 37 and uh, one key verse that tells us that is in verse 6 here of chapter 38 where God says this he says, and I will deliver you from this city, from the hand of the king of Assyria, I will defend this city. Now that is the event that we thought about last week. We've already been told about that. So what's going on here now is that this is actually like a bit of a flashback, uh, thinking back to a time 15 or 20 years earlier. And uh, probably the reason why it's out of chronological order is so that our focus now is drawn in to see and to consider this king, King Hezekiah, and to consider, well, what is he like? And in, in particular, to think, well, is he the Messiah that Isaiah has been speaking about? And certainly that's the effect that it has. It moves us away from the events of uh, wars between nations and international crises to bring our focus here to something much more intimate and much more private in those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. So it's not an international crisis like we heard about last week, but it's no less a crisis, is it, for Hezekiah? And uh, maybe it's moments like this when we are faced with a severe illness, when a doctor gives a diagnosis that we don't want to hear. Well, these are the moments that bring us face to face with our own mortality and can be a test of our trust in God. And Hezekiah, as he hears that kind of word from Isaiah, that this illness will end in death, well, in verses 2 and 3, he's deeply shaken and he weeps bitterly. But he knows that he's not alone in this, and so in his tears he also prays. Verse 3, he says, Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion, and have done what is good in your eyes. Now that's not quite the God-centered prayer that Hezekiah prayed last week that was all about God's honor and his reputation and his name being praised. This is a much more desperate cry for God's help and his mercy. And in his kindness, God shows mercy to Hezekiah. And so then Isaiah is given this message from verse five, go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. 
So here Hezekiah is granted more than he could ask or imagine. Not only will his life be spared, that he'll be given an extra 15 years, but also he's given the promise that Jerusalem will be spared. The city, that city will survive itself a threat of certain death. And so we see in this how there's this strong parallel between the fate of the king of God's people and God's people themselves. What happens to Hezekiah on a personal level is also what will happen to Judah on a national level. Both face a deadly crisis and both will be given a reprieve. And following this good news uh, that he will be healed, well, Isaiah also tells of an amazing sign to confirm to Hezekiah that God will keep his promise in verse eight. God says, I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the 10 steps it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. And so the sunlight went back the 10 steps it had gone down. Now, according to verse 22, a bit later there in the chapter, um, Hezekiah had asked for a sign And when he's given it, he believes it, which is much different to Ahaz also mentioned there. Remember back in chapter 7, who was given a sign but didn't believe. And this is quite an amazing sign that God promises and gives. That this shadow goes backwards up the steps. I mean, it's a sign of time moving backwards or of Hezekiah being given more time. And how exactly God moved the shadow backwards, it's a bit hard to be sure about. Um, The commentaries have all kinds of opinions. I mean, did God reverse the rotation of the earth for a few minutes in order to make that happen? I mean, he could have. Uh, Or was it maybe a more localised event, an eclipse or a refraction of light or something like that? I mean, however he did it, it was something very, very much out of the ordinary that God did. Something very extraordinary just like the defeat of the Assyrian army that we thought about last week, that great miracle that God did for his people. And so God here gives this spectacular sign. But then come to verse 21, where we're told the actual mechanism of how the healing was achieved. In verse 21, it says, Isaiah had said, prepare a poultice of figs and apply it to the boil and he will recover. So we're told here now that this is the issue that's causing his illness, this boil. And Isaiah tells exactly what to do. And uh, for those of you with medical degrees, I mean, this might seem like some primitive medicine to us, um, mashing up some figs and putting it on the infected area. And certainly I'll defer to those with medical training in the room. But look, one medical professional says that putting sugar solutions like this on an infected area is a good way of cleaning infected wounds. And so what we're really being told about here is a, is a very simple application of medicine that brought about the healing. And it is, I think, very interesting here to notice in this passage how God can do the very, very extraordinary you know, make the shadow go backwards up the steps. But God also uses and often does use the very ordinary, the sugar solution uh, in the mashed up figs. And so Barry Webb in his commentary on this makes a very helpful point about how God's people should think about sickness and healing and modern medicine and God's place in all of that. When he says this, he says, there is no disjunction in scripture between miraculous and natural healing, as though God were involved in one and not the other. So he is as much Lord of the soothing poultice as he is of the moving shadow. And he says, perhaps our eyes would be more open and our hearts more thankful if, we, if only we could grasp this simple and sane biblical truth more firmly. I think that's worth reflecting on that. Do you see what it's saying? It means that if you have ever recovered from any illness, I mean, if you have ever experienced any kind of healing, which we all have, well, it is God that you have to thank. And whether God did it through a special healing service at a church or whether he did it through 
the medicine prescribed by your GP, well, he is the Lord of both. And so he is the one to thank. And so Hezekiah in this chapter, well, firstly, we meet him as the suffering king. And I think he's a good model to us in how he expresses his trust in God at this terribly difficult time, given that terrible diagnosis. And he's also a good model in how he now expresses his great thankfulness in response to his recovery from illness. And one of the ways that he does express his thankfulness that we see next is through a song. So Hezekiah now sings of what this experience has meant to him. And there's kind of two main parts to it. The first is a song of lament, um, and the second half a song of praise. So first of all, from verses 10 to 14, he sings of the shock that he felt when he was first given that diagnosis. And in this lament, he sings of his anger at God. He sings of his tears. Um, he sings of his feeble but faithful prayers. And I think in this lament, he shows us how in our sufferings that we can do that too. He shows us that we can tell God how we really feel, how we can cast all our anxiety upon him because he cares for you. And then as he experiences God's deliverance, well, he sings about that as well. So in verses 15 and 16, he sings about how he will now walk humbly before the Lord because of this trial. Uh, in verse 17, he sings, Surely it was to my benefit that I suffered such anguish. Now, I think that is a very mature view of sickness and suffering, isn't it? To see that God is somehow at work in it for our good and our benefit. Uh, for Hezekiah, it makes him humble. Uh, and in verse 17, it gives him a deeper appreciation of God's love and also a greater gratitude for God's forgiveness. He rejoices in the assurance that God has put all of his sins behind his back. I mean, that's what you really want to know when faced with a difficult diagnosis that you've been forgiven that God has put all of your sins behind his back. And so this gives Hezekiah then a greater determination to praise God and also to invite others to join him in doing that. And so the song ends with this invitation and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. And so he continues to be a good model to us through this chapter. Rather than becoming bitter or resentful because of his illness, Hezekiah, as he reflects in this song, he recognises that this has been God's means of teaching him something priceless. Just like the Apostle uh, Peter speaks about, he says, though for a little while you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, in this you greatly rejoice. For these have come to prove the genuineness of your faith, which is of greater worth than God's. And certainly that has been proved here in Hezekiah. And so as we come to the end of chapter 38, well, I think if we were to give Hezekiah a rating, well, at this point, he's still getting a pretty solid thumbs up. Uh, he's responding to suffering with faith. He's responding to salvation with singing. Could this be the king that we're looking for? Well, if the record of King Hezekiah ended at the end of chapter 38, then that might have been a possibility. But sadly, as we continue, the record of the final episode of his life is much more of a letdown. Because see what happens next from uh, chapter 39 and verse 1. It says, At that time, Marduk Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of his illness and recovery. Well, that's nice, isn't it? The king of Babylon hears about Hezekiah's sickness, so he sends him a get well card and a present. Very kind. And uh, the word uh, for gift used there, it's the word that's also translated as offering. And one of the things that we've heard uh, through Isaiah is how one day people from the nations will bring offerings into Jerusalem. And here's a little sign of that. But disappointingly, he, Hezekiah, he doesn't say anything about the Lord. He just accepts this offering for himself. 
And in verses 2 and 3, he then gives the visitors an extensive tour of his palace and its treasures, such that it says that there was nothing in his palace or in all of his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Well, after doing that, Isaiah turns up with some questions. What did those men say? Where did they come from? What did they see in your palace? And we notice that Hezekiah answers two out of the three questions. They came from Babylon. They saw everything. But Hezekiah doesn't mention at all what it is that they discussed, which is really a big clue that the topic of conversation was all about forming an alliance. And we know that that's exactly what he did, and that's exactly what God has been saying not to do. And so sadly, Hezekiah is acting just like Ahaz before him. And so just like Isaiah said to Ahaz back in chapter 7, well, he now says to Hezekiah that this is going to come back to bite him. So Isaiah speaks here in verses 6 and 7 of a time about 100 years in the future of when the Babylonians will return to Jerusalem, but not as allies. At that time, they will be, well, Judah will be just another kingdom to conquer for Babylon the Great. And they will do that very successfully. And all of the treasures, all of these things that uh, Hezekiah has shown off to the Babylonians, they will be carried off into exile. And after being told that news, well, the final words of Hezekiah recorded for us in verse 8 really only serve to underline our disappointment with this king. So see what he says. The, says, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. Now, friends, that is not the king you want. A king who is concerned only about his own welfare. A king unable to secure any lasting peace for his people. And so at the end of this chapter and at the end of the day, we see that for all that is good in Hezekiah, well, he is only human and he is selfish and sinful just like the rest of us. And he leaves us longing for something more, for someone more. Now it's almost Christmas time. And uh, like most things that go on break, we're going to have a break from Isaiah for a little while. We'll pick it up sometime in the new year. But when we do, well, we'll begin to be introduced to a king to come who will not let us down. Because as we move into the second half of Isaiah, we'll start to hear of a servant of the Lord who will bring an end to the exile, who will restore God's reign over the nations. Surprisingly, he'll be described as a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. But unlike Hezekiah, he won't care only for his own welfare. Instead, he will bear our suffering. And it will be by his wounds that we are healed. And also, unlike Hezekiah, he won't be spared from death. Rather, he will pour out his life unto death for us. He will be pierced for our transgressions. He will, be, he will suffer for our iniquities. And as, as he does that for us, well, that is how God will put all of our sins behind his back. Now, of course, I'm talking about the king who will be born in Bethlehem. The king who will be given the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He'll be the king that as he passes through death to resurrection life, well, he will also take his people through death to resurrection life and into a kingdom of peace and security that lasts forever. Friends, he is the king that the world has been waiting for. And if there's one thing that Hezekiah did get right, which we should learn from him today, it's that his response was one of singing. Because when he experienced that miraculous salvation, his response was that he sang praise to God. And that's one of the great things about Christmas, isn't it? It's a time of singing. I don't know what it looks like in your house. Maybe now's the time when the Mariah Carey CD or the Michael Bublé CD comes out. 
because that's what we do at Christmas. And that's what happened at the first Christmas. Mary sang. She sang, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. Zechariah sang. He sang, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago. The angels sang. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. And why did they sing? Well, they sang because the true king had come. Because today in the town of David, a saviour is born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And so how about for you this Christmas? Will this be your joy and your song? That even in this world of sin, as you remember the true king, that the better king has come to us, or may we join with the angels and proclaim his holy birth and praises sing to God the king and peace to all the earth. Let me pray for us this Christmas. God and Father, we do praise you and we thank you that in a world of suffering and sickness and sin, that you gave us your son to be the one true king. We thank you that he came to redeem and to forgive and to restore. And so may we rejoice in him as our saviour and our king this Christmas. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing praise to our God. <laughs>